Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading to James chapter 1, if you would please. James chapter 1. I'd like to read two verses together this morning. The last two verses of James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Since it's just two verses, we'll just read them in unison together this morning. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. James chapter 1, beginning together on verse 26. Ready? If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today and what we've already uh, been able to sing and to hear. Lord, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you for the good spirit that's here. Thank you for each one that is present in attendance, Lord. And we're asking that you would make our hearts ready to receive your word today. Lord, we don't want to just go through the motions of listening to a sermon. We want you to speak to our heart. And so, Lord, I pray that our heart would be in tune with yours this morning. Help us to put out of our mind things that would distract us and uh, cause us not to hear what you would want to say to each of us today. I pray your blessing on the special. In Jesus' name, amen. Some men try so hard to prove that God's not really real, while others say they know for sure His love you cannot feel, but I know He's real within my soul. For one day he cleansed and made me whole, and Jesus is still the answer for that longing deep in your soul. Jesus is still the answer, and no time and age is Jesus is still the answer, he's the answer for your soul. And though some may say he doesn't fit with their philosophy, I know Jesus is still the answer, he's always been and always will be. Some men pretend that the things of this world have brought them peace of mind. But with the dawn of each new day, new thrills they try to find. Not until they meet the Prince of Peace can they ever hope to find release. For Jesus is still the answer for a world that's seeking for peace. Jesus is still the answer. And no time and ages roll, Jesus is still the answer. He's the answer for your soul. And though some may say he doesn't fit with their philosophy, I know Jesus is still the answer. He's always been and always will be. I know Jesus is still the answer. He's always been and always will be. 
Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we prepare to open your word. We're thankful, Lord, of what she just sang about, that Jesus is still the answer. Lord, I pray that Christ will be exalted here this morning, that, Lord, that <clears throat> we'll rightly divide the word of truth, that, Holy Spirit of God, you'll minister to people as only you can. I ask you, Lord, to go up and down the aisle and in and out of every row and stop at every occupied seat and minister to the people in this room this morning. May the Word of God be quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. May it accomplish exactly what you desire that it accomplish in our hearts and lives this morning. Help me as I bring the message and help the people as they listen. May your will be done, please. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Someone said there's probably one class of people that could rival politicians when it comes to talking more and saying less, and that would be theologians. I read this definition of uh, religion written by a theologian. Are you ready? <clears throat> theologian's definition of religion. Religion originates in an attempt to represent and order beliefs, feelings, Im imaginings, and actions that arise in response to direct experience of the sacred and the spiritual. As this attempt expands in its formulation and elaboration, it becomes a process that creates meaning for itself on a sustaining basis in terms of both its originating experiences and its own continuing responses. Well, isn't that a blessing? Huh? How many are glad you came this morning? Amen? Yeah. And now you know what religion is. You know, if I can, if I can interpret that for you, basically, uh, a, a religion is things we try to do to please God and to be accepted by Him so we can have eternal life. That's religion. The Bible normally does not speak well of religion. And uh, that's not what, uh, what you found this morning. What she just sang is the truth. Religion isn't the answer. Jesus is the answer. <clears throat> it's not a religion. It is knowing Him as your Savior and having a relationship with Him. There's a big difference between Christianity and religion. There's a big difference between knowing Christ and just being religious. There are, <clears throat> there are churches that are filled with people this morning that are being religious, but they're not necessarily Christians. There are people, I'm sure, in the room this morning that some are Christians and some are not Christians. You're just religious. Jesus called them wheat and tares. And they look very similar. You can't tell the difference. You can't tell because, oh, somebody has a, a suit and tie on, they must be a Christian. No, don't, don't be deceived by that. Okay? Don't, don't be deceived by the outward looks. People sit in the same pew, they sing the same songs, they listen to the same message, but one is saved and one is lost. One knows Christ and one does not know Christ. What's the test of what James says is pure religion? What's the, what's the test that somebody really knows God? James, you know, James is all about where the rubber meets the road. James, with James' book, you don't, you don't just say something to James and he takes it. He doesn't just say, just I'll take your word for it. James says, show me. Show me. Don't say you have faith, show me your faith. Don't say you do this, show me you do this. James is all about... Uh, you show me what you got. He might have been from Missouri, huh? the show me state. But this is, a, this is a great test here to see are we, not, not just am I a Christian or truly a Christian, because certainly <clears throat> one can know Christ and be in, a, be in what, what would the Bible would say a backslidden condition or a condition where you're away from God. And, and some of you have been in that place and you're back with God now, but you've had a period of time in your life when you were away from God. But I think this is more of a test of <clears throat> our, our spiritual maturity. Am I, 
Am I growing as a Christian? Am I maturing as a Christian? What are the marks in my life of a mature Christianity? Look at James chapter 3 with me, will you please? Just over, I don't have to turn a page in my Bible, maybe you do. <clears throat> Notice what he says here in James chapter 3. My brethren, okay, my brethren, is he talking to saved people or lost people? Save people. Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man. Now when the Bible says perfect, it doesn't mean you're sinless. It just means you're mature. Okay? I can, there, there, you might look at a piece of fruit sometime and say, boy, that's a perfect apple. Or that's a perfect orange. It doesn't mean there's no flaw in it at all. Just means it's well rounded, it's ripe, it's good, it's 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 perfect in your size, or it's 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 mature. Okay, so you're mature, and you're able also to bridle the whole body. So here is the test that he gives us about whether we're mature or not in the faith, whether we're mature as Christians, are growing as we ought to. There's three marks that he gives. Number one is a tongue that's under control. A tongue that's under control. Not only here about offending not in word, but notice verse 26 of our text this morning. He said, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his what? Tongue. Notice what he says. <clears throat> but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Vain means empty. Nothing. There's nothing there. So he says, you know, uh, we had an old-fashioned doctor when I was growing up. He was the, a general practitioner. I know those are rare guys to find anymore. Everybody's a specialist, you know. But we'd go to the Dr. Ziegler when I was growing up and go to his office, and he always had that uh, big canister sitting on his desk, and it was full of uh, the uh, tongue depressors. First thing he ever did, sat down in the chair, he took the lid off that thing, he said, hey, open your mouth and say, ah, oh, and then he'd press that tongue down. You'd look in your throat, look at your tongue. They could tell a lot about your health just by looking at your tongue. Did you know you can tell a lot about your spiritual condition? By looking at your tongue. By listening to your tongue. Listening to what comes out of your mouth. You see, it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. That's why he said, if you don't bridle your tongue, you're deceiving your own heart. See, because it's out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes when, when uh, I was listening this morning to uh, Adrian Rogers, uh, I think he's on at 6.30 in the morning on uh, the 91.5, and, and it was really interesting what he said this morning, and I thought about this. He said, you know, if, if uh, water, it's not, it's not real full, but it's getting up there. But what happens when I jostle that, what come out? Water. What, what comes out of you when you get jostled? Somebody jostled. Somebody said the other day they're with somebody and they got jostled and a curse word came out. I've, had, I've been around people and that happened. You know, it's like, oh, I don't know where that came from. I do. It came from your heart. I got a baptized hand now, but... It came from your heart. It, because you allowed, through this, something to come into here. And then what's, the old, the old farmer said, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. And what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since. Jesus. Came where? Into my heart. Well, if Jesus is in my heart, what ought to come out of my mouth? Jesus. I'll be talking about Jesus Christ. I'll be talking about the things of God. And so it, it, the test here that he gives is not the ability to speak your mind. It's the ability to silence your tongue. Well, preacher, I just say what's on my mind. That's the way I am. Well, the Bible says, a fool uttereth all his mind. So you're identifying yourself as someone who's not real positive. The Bible says you're foolish to do that. Most of us are like the fellow who said, well, I'd like to tell you more, but I've already told you more than I know. <laughs> I 
On a windswept hill in an English churchyard stands a drab gray tombstone. It bears an epitaph that's not easily seen until you look real close. And it reads like this. Beneath this stone, a lump of clay, lies Arabella Young, who on the 24th of May finally began to hold her tongue. Boy. What does the Bible say about our tongue? Well, it says we ought to have a helpful tongue. Ephesians 4 and verse 29 says, let no corrupt communication. In fact, look at Ephesians 4. Would you do that? We'll come back to James. But take your Bible and look at Ephesians 4. I'd like you to see these verses. Ephesians 4. Have a helpful tongue. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Saying, our mouth is to be helpful. Words ought to come out that build people up. How many will admit that's a struggle for you at times because you tend to be very sarcastic? Anybody like that? Yeah, there's a few of you honest in here. And we're, we're kind of in that, that's kind of the way the world is. You know, you know you may be too far the wrong way when you begin to be complimentary or building someone up and they look at you and say, okay, what are you up to? Okay, what do you want? Hmm? Then maybe you haven't been given out enough good things. Things that build people up. And when, when the Bible says have a helpful tongue... It, it, notice what he says. It's good to the use of edifying. That's building people up. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, now grace, whether some people believe that, that's just the undeserved favor of God. And it is. So what we say to others can be undeserved. But it ought to be favorable. Well, they don't deserve me to compliment them. Well, that's probably why you should. You understand? You say, well, why would I say that to them? They don't deserve that. Uh, did God give you what you deserved? No, He did. So could we be gracious to people? Just be gracious to them? Have a helpful tongue. Words that edify. Words that build people up. And then... Ephesians also tells us we're to have a truthful tongue. Notice verse 25 of Ephesians 4. Wherefore, putting away, what church? Lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So, we're going to speak truth. We're going to have a truthful tongue. You're not, there's no, there's really no such thing as a saved liar. Okay? It, it's to be true. You're, you're saved from lying. Now we speak the truth. We speak the truth in love. We're going to be honest. Honesty isn't just the best policy. Honesty is the only policy. And you have to be honest. You can, listen, you, you may not be able to help having false teeth, but you can help from having a false tongue. A person with an uncontrolled tongue, according to James, is a person that is not a doer of the Word. He is a person that is certainly not a mature Christian. Because you can't control your tongue. It's a tongue that, that, that is able to be bridled. Put that... The, the, the bridle means you can you, 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 you control what comes out. You limit what comes out. You don't have to say everything you know. You don't have to say everything you think. Can I help you with something, Christian, too? So you understand something? The devil cannot read your mind, but he can hear your words. And you verbalize something out loud, 
he hears it, or his demons hear it. And buddy, they'll know how to attack you. If you're struggling with something, and, or, or you're tired, or you're, you know, it, it doesn't help you at all, and it doesn't help the, your, the enemy who would like to attack you by you saying, Oh, I'm so tired. Oh, I just did this. I'm just this. I'm just so frustrated today. I'm just so this. What you're doing is, Satan, here's, here's my areas you can hit me with. Doesn't do any good to verbalize that. Keep it in. You know who can say, well, if I just think it, who reads your thoughts? God. Only God. David said, you know my thoughts are far off. God will know your thoughts. And by the way, that's who you're supposed to take it to. Is take it to God. Take it to God. A gossiper, a rumor spreader, a critical person is only seeming to be religious. If any of you seem to be religious and bridle not their tongue, their religion is vain. So he says the first test is a tongue that's under control. And by the way, when you read when you, James, when you look at James 3, by the way, if you're there, look at James 3. Notice, notice verse number 8. James 3 and verse 8. The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. How many, how many of you know that little, that little song you sang when you were a kid? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but... Words can never hurt me. How many of you know that's not true? Some of you through the years, you'd rather somebody threw a stick or stone at you than the words they used. The proverb says they, those words go down deep. They pierce deep. They leave deep wounds. And, and so be careful what you say. But listen, God reminds us here, the tongue can no man tame. You're not going to do it on your own. You better have help. Now, if no man can tame it, we have to look to somebody else, don't we? You have to ask God to help you. When somebody says, I, I, I just talk, I can't help it. You're right, you can't. But God can. God can. And look to Him to help you. And that's part of your growing, and that's part of your Christian maturity, is being able to control your tongue. The second test that he gives us here, the second mark, if you will, of pure religion, of growing in grace, of being a mature Christian, is verse number 27 when he says, you visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. <clears throat> and I just put that under, you have a care for others. You have a care, you have a concern for other people. In 1 John chapter 3, <clears throat> verse number 17, notice what, God says here through John, <clears throat> verse 17, Whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Then you, you have... And you see somebody, your brother has a need, and you have it to give to them, and you say, hey, I'll be praying for you, brother. God says, you don't have a concern for others. Remember the early church in Jerusalem? Remember what they, what they did? They, they, they found out that if somebody needed a coat, and they had two coats, they said, here, I'll give you one. I don't need two. Most people in this room, you go and open a closet up and you could choose any one of eight to ten coats you could put on. And, and yet when there's a need arise and somebody says, hey, can you give to help get some coats for people? You say, man, I, we're just too tight. I just don't have anything. We just can't afford that right now. It's quiet in here this morning. Nothing, listen, anytime you care for others, it's going to involve some time. Always. Most, most, the, the most used excuse is, I just don't have the time. 
But we have time to socialize. We have time for recreation. We have time for friends. We have time for Facebook or Pinterest. We have time for Netflix. But no time for others. And by the way, even if people reject the gospel, they still need to know we care about them. We care about them. I read this this week. <clears throat> Jack had been president of a large corporation. When he got cancer, they ruthlessly dumped him. He went through his insurance. <clears throat> went through his insurance, used his life savings, and really had almost nothing left. The pastor said, I went to visit him with one of my deacons, and the deacon said, Jack, you speak openly about the brief life you have left. I wonder if you prepared for life after death. Jack stood up, livid with rage. You blankety-blank Christians. All you ever think about is what's going to happen to me after I die. If your God's so great, why doesn't he do something about the real problems of my life? And he went on to tell them I was leaving his wife penniless and his daughter without any money for college. And he ordered us out. He said, we left and several weeks went by and my deacon insisted that we go back. And so we did. Jack opened the door and my deacon said, Jack, I want you to know I offended you, and I humbly apologize. And I want you to know I've been working on some things since I last saw you. Your first problem, you asked, was where your family's going to live after you die. And he said, a realtor in our church has agreed to sell your house and give his commission to your wife. And I guarantee you that if you'll permit us, some other men and I will make the house payments until your house is sold. Then I've contacted the owner of an apartment house down the road. He said he has offered your wife a three-bedroom apartment plus free utilities and an $850 a month salary in return for collecting rents and supervising the office. The income from your house should pay for your daughter's college. He said, Jack, I just wanted to let you know your family's going to be cared for. And Jack cried like a baby. Now he died shortly thereafter and he, he did not accept Christ. But he did experience somebody who loved him and he knew that God loved him. His wife and daughter both responded to the gospel and received Christ as their Savior. George Mueller of the orphanages in England, always without a salary, relying only on God to meet his needs, would never tell anyone his needs, only would tell God. Several million dollars were prayed in by him over his lifetime a man of great faith. He kept a motto on his desk that he looked at daily and it read this, it matters to him about you. It matters to him about you. He thought that those words captured the meaning of 1 Peter 5, 7 about casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. And he thought, what that verse is really saying is it matters to him about you. Isn't that great? Aren't you glad you matter to God? Aren't you glad that he cares about us? And he testified, Mueller did at the end of his life when he uh, lived to be 93 years of age. That he testified that, 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 that God had never failed to supply his needs. And by the way, when you want the faith that Mueller had, they found his Bible when he died and he had read his Bible through over 200 times. <clears throat> P. 
People may not remember exactly what you did or what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. They will. The young woman was married and she had two beautiful children. But one day as she was standing over the sink washing dishes, she said there must be more to life than this. She wrote that on a piece of paper and she left. And when her husband came home, he found the note she'd written and he began to weep. She'd call him once a week to check on the children. He would always tell her that he loved her and he wanted her to come home. But she would always say no and hang up. Finally, he hired a private investigator to find out where she was. And he went to the apartment where she was staying, nervously holding a bouquet of flowers. Finally, he worked up the nerve to ring the doorbell after he rehearsed over and over what he would say. When she opened the door, he started to speak, but she began to weep and fell into his arms. And through her tears, she said, let's go home. Well, they went home. Several months went by, and they were healing in their relationship. And finally, he worked up the courage to ask her what had been bothering him for several months. He said, all those times I talked to you on the phone and I asked you to come home, you said no. Why did you come back now? And she looked at him and she said, well, before you were telling me that you loved me. But when you came, you showed me that you loved me. You showed me that you loved me. Can I tell you this morning, you can read all you want about how God loved you. But I want to tell you to something. He didn't just tell you He loved you. He showed you He loved you. He came. He came in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And He came down and lived the life here on earth of a man without sin. And then went to the cross and hung there and bled and died for your sins and for mine. God showed us that He loved us. He didn't just tell us. Could you show somebody that you care? Don't just tell somebody you care. Show them that you care. Don't just love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. There's the first two tests. The tongue under control and a concern for others. And then the third thing is verse 27 of, of James 1. The third test is a clean testimony. Did you notice what he said in James 1, verse number 27? He said, Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know, the Bible says as believers we're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. In fact, the Bible makes it pretty clear, 1 John 2.11, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, if God tells us and has to command us not to love the world, it must be an issue with us. It must be something that easily we can fall into. And we get to, to loving the, uh, the things of this life and the things of God grow very, very small. And the things of the world get big. I don't think he's just talking about the normal things we think about when it says don't love the world. I'm talking about the the, the sins we think about with the world. I think he's being careful that we don't begin to think like the world thinks. That we don't uh, begin to get the attitude that the world has. The world's way of doing things. You see, Christian, we're in the world, we're not of the world. We are, when, by the way, that's why a church in the Bible is a called out assembly of believers 
called out from where? The world. You were called out from the world and gathered, assembled together here this morning. That's why we don't bring the world into the church. Then you're not called out anymore. Listen, it's okay for the ship to be in the ocean, but that ship's in trouble when the ocean gets in the ship. And the church is okay as long as she's in the world, but when the world gets in the church, you've got problems. And the church has taken on water. We're to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. The Bible says three things here. We're not to love the world. We are not to conform to the world. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Conformed means to be poured into their mold. Conformed means to be made like or to be in harmony with. We're not to be like. We're not to be in harmony with the world. That's a plain command of God. But what are we to do then? We're to be transformed. And by the way, the world does that to you. The world, you, you'll feel the pressure to, to conform, to be like everybody else. Oh, the world talks about individuality, but really they're all alike. And they behave alike and they think alike. And, 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 and if you don't want to, if you want to think differently, and if you follow the Word of God, you think differently, then buddy, you, you'll find out they're not so tolerant of other views. So we have to be careful we don't conform to the world and get poured and pressed into their mold. We get transformed by Christ. We get changed by Him. The other night at the prison, I had a man in our group who was just a new Christian, and he says, you know, I still struggle. I, even when I'm reading my Bible, bad thoughts will come to my mind. And it just bothers me that I can't get rid of those thoughts. And I, and, and I had to encourage him, you will. It's just a process. You have to continue to fill your mind and your heart up with the Word of God. And the more you fill it up <clears throat> with the things of God, those thoughts are going to get pushed out. And, and, and you have to continue with the Word of God and keep filling your mind with that. And you won't conform to the world. You know what happens? You begin to be transformed. We had one fellow I shared with the people on Friday night. The very first principle of Reformers Unanimous is if God's against it, so am I. Boy, you got to get that one down first. If God's against it, so am I. Boy, a lot of Christians could get that down too, amen? And, and by the way, if God's for it, so am I. No, no, none of this, well, I think, no, 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 no. Well, well, I don't see, no, no, none of that. God says it, that's it. I believe it, all right? And this fellow, just, just only a second week in our year. And he looked at this fellow who was having trouble with the thoughts, and he said, you know, he said, I've, I've got a temper problem. He says, I, I, just gotta, I just lose my temper real easy. Don, I think, heard it when the guy said that. And he said, you know, and last week, I don't know if I read it or I heard it. I don't know where, where I got it, but, I, but it, was, it was this. If God's against it, so am I. And he said those words, and he said, you know, this week my celly, it cellmate got, got in my face, wanted to kind of pick a fight, and, and man, I felt, you know, felt getting mad, and he said, and that thought came to my mind, if God's against it, so am I. And I thought, God's against this. I'm against it too. And he said, I backed off, and said, I'm not going to fight you. Here's a guy, two weeks old in the Lord. Huh? And he's got something that right there that's going to help him immensely. See? He says, I'm going to do what God says and not what I think. And not what I want to do. I'll do what God says is right. You see, there's no middle ground. If you're not, if you're not going to conform to the world, you're to be transformed by Christ. If you're not being transformed by Christ, you will conform to the world. And you'll get pressed into their way of thinking. Number three, he says, we're to be unspotted from the world. We are not to love the world. We are not to conform to the world. We are to be unspotted from the world. Ephesians says he's going to present us to Christ as a bride without spot and without wrinkle. Clean and pure and holy before God. 2 Timothy 2 talks about how there's different vessels in the house. And In fact, look there with me, will you? Let's just uh, take a minute and look there. I think this will be good for you to see. 2 Timothy chapter 2.
Notice verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. God says here, here at a great house called a church, there's many kind of different vessels. Some are gold and silver. Some are of wood. He says uh, wood and earth. Okay. Now you think about that in the light of the judgment. What will hold up to the fire. Okay. You're going to understand the different kinds of vessels that are here. Some, uh, some to honor, some to dishonor. Some people in this room today, you're living a life that's honoring to God. And some are living a life that is dishonoring to God. That's what the Bible says. Verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. Sanctified means set apart and meet. That means he's able, he's ready, he's usable for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. It says we ought to be vessels that are clean and pure for God to use. Every one of us had the experience of with the dishwashers of today, to grab a cup or grab a glass out of the cupboard and you go to put some liquid in it and you have to look inside and you say, whoa, something in there. Some crud that didn't get out, you know, some, 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 some didn't clean. And you don't say, oh, well. You set it aside and say, that needs to be cleaned. And you'll get a clean vessel to use. When God opens his cupboard to pick out a vessel to use, he wants it to be clean. Amen. Be a clean vessel. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Ask God to help you with that. It all begins, listen, the, these are the marks of maturity as a believer. Marks of maturity as a Christian. Could you, could you ask God to help you develop this in your life? Could you ask God to help you to mature in your faith? To have a controlled tongue? To have a care for others? And to have a clean testimony? You see, that's all, that's all about us being justified, not, not in the sight of God, but in the sight of man. That's really what James focuses on. The way you're justified in the sight of God is by faith. I can't see your faith. You can't see my faith. God sees faith. God can see our heart. What You know what I can see? I can see your works. And that's what James is saying. James is saying, you'll be justified in the sight of men by your works. You'll be justified in the sight of God by your faith. No amount of works will ever justify you in the sight of God. Doesn't matter how much you do, it's not going to be enough. God is looking for your faith. And you're justified by faith in the sight of God when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you trust Him alone as your Savior. If you've never made that decision, you never put your faith in Christ alone, that's where it starts. Then He begins a work in you. And He will perform it until He comes back for us. And he takes us to heaven. Let's, let's have, hey, let's have pure religion. Let's have these marks of a mature believer in each of our lives. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for the plainness of James and Spirit of God as you gave him the truth in this epistle. And, Lord, this morning we, we understand that if we're going to be mature, perfect. That we need to have a tongue that's under control. We need to have a concern for others and we need to have a clean testimony. We desire that, Lord. We desire you to do that in us and through us. That we might be vessels unto honor for our God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a minute.
But I wonder right now with their heads bowed and eyes closed, just between you and God, I wonder how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, I'm, you said we're justified by faith in the sight of God. And Pastor, there's a time in my life when I put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I know that if I died today, I'm 100% sure I'd go to heaven because my faith is in what Jesus Christ has done for me. And I've received his gift of eternal life. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Say, I know that I'm saved. There's no doubt about it. Okay, you may put them down. Is there anybody here today would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I do not have the assurance that if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to have that assurance. Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up and put it back down that I'll see it and say, just pray for me? All right. The message was to believers today. wonder how many believers here this morning would say, Pastor, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart this morning about these three marks of mature Christianity. I want God to develop these in me. I want to be a vessel unto honor to God. The Spirit of God spoke to my heart today. Pastor, pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Say, pray for me this morning. God bless you. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. Listen carefully. God has spoken to your heart. Then you respond to him this morning. The altar is open for you to come and pray. If you're here today and you're saved, and since you've been saved, you've not been scripturally baptized, that's a first step of obedience to God, to being a vessel unto honor to him come and say, preacher, I'm saved, but I need to be obedient and be baptized. Maybe you're saved and baptized and you want to belong to Bible Baptist Church and serve the Lord here. Then you come and you, on your profession of faith and your statement of faith, you've been saved and scripturally baptized. We can receive you into our church and you can begin to serve the Lord at Bible Baptist Church. Whatever it is that God's dealt with your heart about today, just obey him. Listen to him and obey him this morning. Father, bless this invitation. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. Thank you for your word. I pray now that each individual will do exactly what you're telling them to do in their heart. May your will be done in these next few minutes. And I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob will sing the invitation hymn. God has spoken to your heart. Respond Have to him this morning, way, will you please? Lord, That's right. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me.
Father, we thank you now for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us and for speaking to our hearts today. Lord, it was good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for your care for us. I pray, Lord, that we would live the Bible we've learned today. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And, Lord, I pray that each of us would leave today and be aware of allowing you to control our heart so it will control our tongue. To give us the concern and the care for others that you have. That you could love them through us. And that you would keep us unspotted from the world. That we could be vessels unto honor for you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for being our God. Give us a good afternoon. Lord, prepare our hearts for what you have for us tonight as we return for the evening service. And I'll thank you for it. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Let's sing it together, shall we, Brother Bob? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight.